Hello, everyone. Welcome to day three of the Thriving in the First Year Summit. We are thrilled to have you with us. Day three. Woohoo. Come and let us know in the comment box if you can hear us, see us, um, and all of your thoughts and feelings from today. We would love to hear. So if we haven't met already, which is pretty unlikely, but in the case that we haven't, my name is Holly. I am a pediatric occupational therapist. I am the co-host with Kaylee for the summit. Um, and I do various other things as well when it comes to supporting clinicians and also parents. Um, so I will hand over to you, Kaylee, to share a little bit more about who you are. Sure. I'm Kaylee Noland. I'm a pediatric physical therapist and creator of the Movement Mama community. I guess I didn't share that on any of the other days either, but if you don't know me, you can find me at the Movement Mama. Um, we have shared this in day one and day two, but as much as I would love to be there live in on day three with you, I am currently 34 weeks pregnant and some change and I'm actually due a week before the summit and so to try to honor that time and be able to be fully present and be able to talk about these exciting things we are pre-recording these lives but Holly and maybe myself we'll see how I'm feeling um because I love to hear from you guys we'll be live in the comments so meaning we are pre-recording what we have to say but we are still going to be there in the comments with you guys we can't wait to hear all of that you're taking away from the speakers any questions you have that's a great spot to go to if maybe you're confused about a tech question you can quickly pop it in there um, something that maybe you wanted clarification on from one of the the speakers in their chats if uh, most likely if you've got the question someone else does as well and so it creates this sense of community and camaraderie um, between caregivers and clinicians and um, so we are absolutely there with you in the comments as you're watching this, but we are recording our portion um, ahead of time. Yeah, you know, it's such a privilege actually to be part of these summits. We have thousands of people in attendance at the summit and we are across the globe. So we have an international audience and we are across professionals and parenting. So we bring forward all of these topics in the hope that it influences the way that we practice and the way that we allow children to thrive but we also bring them forward in terms of putting them into dialogue uh, we really do believe that in in the summit although you are like a recipient and you are learning and hearing what someone else has to say we want to hear your thoughts as well and um, we have of course like space for you to give us feedback at the end of the summit but hearing what your takeaways were for, from today, hearing the thing that like really perked your interest or the thing that actually changed the way you were showing up as a parent today or showing up as a clinician. These are really like, they they contribute towards that ocean of, you know, as the, the tide rises, all of the boats rise. So we, we want you to be part of this ocean, these drops in this ocean of, of letting our tide rise and really engaging around this topic. And at the end of the day, helping these gorgeous babies to thrive. And um, so that is what we are all about over here. So I am with you in the comment box for sure. I'm typing away whenever I do these lives and I'm just talking and I'm trying to type. It's like, it's a bit of chaos. So I'm with you to, to really like talk through things on the, the comment box. And also if you have any tech questions, um, please shoot us an email on that. It's if often we get like communication through Facebook and Instagram and here and there, it's really easiest in terms of tech that we can just like solve your problem quickly if you send us an email. And here, let us know all of your thoughts and uh, everything that you're learning. And I think with that, Kelly, today we're gonna to be talking about family-centered practice and kind of like looking a little bit more about the biomedical model versus a holistic model of health promotion. Um, but before we get there, we have a prize for today. Uh, do you wanna tell our listeners a little bit more about that? Yes, I'm so excited to share today's sponsor, which is Inspire Spark. This is a company um, created and run by a pediatric physical therapist, which I just always think is so cool. I'm a pediatric PT, like I said, myself and tend to love any product um, automatically that comes out from therapists, but especially ones that I know I can really utilize and get behind because we are the ones that are seeing in the trenches what we need with kiddos. And so um, the first product that I'm going to show you from them uh, is their little balance box. So kind of hard to see the whole thing here. This is a plexiglass top 
and um, these wheels have great shock absorption. I guess they're not even technically wheels. I don't know what you would call these, but just um, they go over any surface. And so it's a push toy essentially that grows with the child and can become an activity table. But what I love about it is because so many of the push toys are so flimsy. And so not only in my clinical life, but with our daughter as well, when she was really wanting to pull up on things and use push toys, I felt like I constantly needed to be there or be adapting the push toy to where it weighed more and she wouldn't face plant um, because it would just go out from under her. So the technology with this is it's a lower height, which they do also make a taller height as well. If you're working with kiddos in the clinic specifically who need a taller um, push toy, but it has that great shock absorption. It's not going to tip over. So when a baby pulls to stand on this, they're going to be really strong and stable and it can move in all directions easily, which makes them that much more motivated to move around. They love to bang on the table. My little guy who used it loved the noise that the plexiglass made, but I loved that this easily would go like up and over our rugs and then onto our hard floor. He could go in all directions. And this is just such an incredible product. So well made. Um, I'm really excited to use it again this time around. And I actually left mine with the clinic that I used to work for until I began staying at home because we used it so much in the clinic. It was so nice to have an option that I didn't have to worry about my kiddos. Um, like I said, face planting. So incredible product by them. And then they also make these hats called Hattivity, and they're really high quality sun hats. They make winter hats as well. A couple of the key features is they have these cute little patches that kids can um, remove or put on or put with whichever ones they want, and it comes with this fun little bag. They also have now released patches that you can add essential oils to. Um, Dr. Shannon, who is the creator, she recommended using kid-friendly oils for different things because they're a little bit more diluted, but she gave the example of like her daughter gets really motion sick in the car and so she may use oils to allow her to have this hat on and be getting in um, all of the benefits of those essential oils um, without having to put them on her skin it's just on her hat um, I know like we have used oils in the past for like bug repellent and things like that and then um, she also spoke to some sensory sensitivity in the grocery store with all the smells that our kiddos can encounter in the store and so I know we're talking about babies but Babies will soon be toddlers and beyond, and they're going to need something like this. It is UPF 50 plus, and she made um, sure to note that certain materials that are um, protected from the sun, after they get wet and dry five or more times, often they lose that sun protection, but not with this material. They've made it in a way that can ensure that you can go out and in the water and let it dry many, many times. sure that the um the brim of the hat is not obstructing their vision lots of kids don't like to wear hats because constantly they're having to flip it up well then we flip it up and it's not protecting their little faces from the sun at all so i love that feature um and then it's also got this inner elastic rather than a strap that goes under your child's chin which improves the safety tremendously so we're making sure that they're not um, going to have the risk of strangling or choking themselves so super excited about this product so cute and fun such a fun add-on if you are um, buying the little balance box as well but we are going to be giving away um, a hat and a little balance box from inspire spark as part of today's daily giveaway just a reminder or maybe a refresher or maybe you haven't joined us yet for a live but to enter to win that giveaway and we'll do that as a combined package we'll give away the hat and the little balance box together one lucky person will take that away and the way that you can enter is to comment below we'll give you bonus points towards the grand prize if you give us maybe a key takeaway or something that um, you learned from today's speakers or something that you're going to change um, moving forward that gives you bonus points and then making sure you're following inspire spark on instagram and we'll make sure to have that link below as well so thank you again so much to inspire spark we love being supported by therapist created um, uh, brands but we also love to support them back as well and we hope that you, you will get a lot of use out of knowing about them
Absolutely. I love that um, the balance box is just so cute and also not like um, some some of the baby stuff is always like so big and colorful and things. I like the kind of like Melimus style mm, on that as well. Yeah. yeah, very much more Montessori style for sure. Um, and something interesting that I didn't even think about is that a lot of those push toys um, activate that Palmer reflex and kids don't know when to let go. And so that leads to a lot of face plants. And so she was talking about um, in kind of her description that she sent me, which I had not even thought about, but that they can have their hands open and in lots of different positions, they can even be resting on their forearms. And so if they do feel their balance going, they're able to let go and release and lower to the floor much more safely. Love that. I love that. Okay. So I think we're going to move on to the top the section where we're going to be talking a little bit more about health promotion. If you haven't checked out today's talks, make sure to go and do that. They are available from for 24 hours on the free ticket. If you have the VIP ticket, this is a distance learning course, so you can listen whenever it suits you, which is very convenient. Um, but today we have Dr. Lizzie Kiefer sharing about postpartum safety and strong return to activity. Dr. Jen Fraboni talking about thriving after a cesarean section. Lauren Hayes and Megan Dalton talking about when a baby is born, so is a mother. I have my talk today, which is combating the mother load of sensory stimulation. And Dr. Cassidy, Freitas is talking about how to overcome mental triggers. Um, so a lot of our focus on today's talks are really looking more at the parent. And I know sometimes, I'm sure as a parent, when you're listening, you're like, yes, this is the information that I need, because you know that you need that mask for yourself before you can put it on your children. But we are also talking to a lot of clinicians here. And I know that sometimes this can feel like, well, I'm treating the baby, not the parent. And I hope that through listening to the, the summit, through being part of this experience, that there's a, a kind of a shift in a focus on how we approach that kind of thinking. So today we wanted to focus the live on talking about this idea of family-centered practice. It's a term that I'm sure you're going to hear over and over again throughout the interviews. And what does that really mean? So in order to understand what that means and where we want to go forward to, let's understand like where we were often starting, or at least where a lot of our clinical um, theory is derived from. So we have here the biomedical model, which often is our first starting point when we're thinking about our children that we're seeing. And I wonder, Kaylee, if you can just break down a little bit of what that what does biomedical model actually mean? Sure. Um... So I did a little digging because I, I needed some more technicality to it, but I think it's something that is so obvious to us once we talk about it, because it is the dominating theme of medicine in West, in Western culture. So it began around the mid 19th century and it aims to understand the pathology or disease at a cellular, cellular level, excuse me, and provide the medical in, intervention to eliminate or to cure that pathogen or damaged tissue. And so within that is also kind of the model of disability. Um, so focusing on disability purely in terms of impairment um, and the impairments that affect that individual, but it does not consider other factors like environment, psychosocial factors, um, and how culture and background and family systems contribute to um, what a person may be experiencing. Yeah, I love I love that you you broke that down. We're not at all in the summer trying to say that we don't rely on the biomedical model for many of our treatment protocols, which is good and right. And it's good that we have this clinical knowledge. But I think I, I always like like to think of this concept of like zooming out and zooming in, and zooming out and zooming in. And that's the dance that we have often when we're working with families, whether we are working as a physiotherapist, whether we I know we have social workers, foster parents, a wide range of people that are um, also coming towards young children with a professional lens. And we all have this job of zooming out and zooming in. So while, yes, we definitely want to know our protocols and the methods that we would use to look at a cellular level at, at whatever um, our child is presenting with, we also want to be able to then zoom out and say, okay, but in the holistic picture, 
what can I do today in my therapy that is going to zoom in, but also zoom out in terms of really looking at how this child can thrive in the long term. And um, I I, we've talked a bit about like different referral mechanisms and that throughout the last couple of days, but I always refer in my mind back to the story of a family that I worked with. Um, they had five children, all of their children, four of their children were in some form of like special education or they, they had a lot of people, um, a lot of therapists working with their families, a lot um, from s- speech therapists, uh, physiotherapists, occupational therapists, social workers, just so many different minds and thoughts with each child. And at one point they had someone come into their home to do just like some supporting of the family. Um, It was a student of some kind. Um, And one of the things that she did, which is, it sounds like to us, it's not necessarily our job. It sounds very small, but she put in a cupboard where the children would put their shoes when they came in the door and when they left. And like, this is, of course, this is not the thing that you learn at in university when you're going to study occupational therapy or physiotherapy, but this one little change that she was able to like help the family with, it meant that those five kids actually got to school on time, that they didn't miss anything. The dynamic of the mornings was completely different, and it's such a small change that I think that if we can have this ability to sometimes zoom out, and maybe we're not really maybe it's not our role to walk families through every kind of health promoting practice that they need maybe it is our role in some places to refer on but sometimes even just providing like a question just bringing some of these things you know out from the the grayness of that doesn't count to maybe this could also help uh can really change the way that we approach things and i think that this is very pertinent when we're talking about a family centered approach because we often we give home programs we we are expecting that our families are following through with what we're doing in therapy and when that doesn't happen there's often like this kind of uncomfortable feeling within the the dynamic so what we're really hoping is that from the summit, as you listen to your different talks, you're kind of thinking more on how can you approach the relationship dynamic with the families, but then also have that skill to zoom out and look at what supports we can provide for families so that that home program or whatever it is can actually be met. Um, So I know that there's been a lot of interviews that have kind of gone into this idea of considering families as part of that interdisciplinary team. And I wonder, Kaylee, if you have like any that come to mind from the interviews that really stood out to you in Mm. terms of working with parents, like any tips? Well, so as you were speaking, I was just thinking about, too, on the side of any caregivers or parents listening, giving you permission to speak up to clinicians. It can be so hard. I'm even guilty of this as a parent when I'm with a pediatrician and they're giving me recommendations. Often we just think we need to nod our head and say, okay, but giving you permission to speak up if something is not feasible for your family, or if there is a roadblock that you've really tried to overcome and figure out, like maybe they're giving you the same exercise every week and you can tell that your your therapist or your provider is, is getting that tension of, you know, why are you not doing this? Communicate, let them know, because often we can be as clinicians, very um, closed off as far as, well, we know this is what's best. We know you want what's best for your child. So why is this not happening? Um, But maybe we just don't know the right questions to ask. So being willing to speak up, like I love that example of the shoe cupboard. And it can be so hard for clinicians too, because we are so driven. I know at least in the US by insurance and Um, funding and payment sources in having to prove that um, someone needs us clinically. They need our clinical skill set and we have to justify it constantly. And so I remember feeling that way when I would sometimes do things where I would think, oh man, I don't know how I'm going to be able to bill for this, but I know that the clinic needs me to be able to bill for this, to keep our doors open and to justify that this child can continue coming back to therapy. Um, But I also think about things like I just had to get creative with how I was explaining things to insurance companies. For example, baby wearing was a big one. If I was able to help empower and equip a parent to be able to walk out of the clinic and be able to baby wear, if that made their life easier to where they were maybe able to 
wear the baby and get the dishes done and dinner ready. And then they, it opened up that time that they didn't have before to maybe work on some of the, the movement and mobility things that I was suggesting at home or, you know, just managing that family dynamic of another sibling. But tell me your question again, because I want to make sure I'm understanding. I just wanted to give that that anecdote and kind of that note for any parents. Yeah, no, I think, you to- I think you totally answered it. Uh, like my, the question was what, like if there were any things that came up throughout the talks of the summit that really were kind of tools or questions or like points of thought for us clinicians in terms of working with families as an interdisciplinary team. Um, mm. But I, you know, what one of the things that came up for me, which is in tomorrow's lineup, um, is an interview. We had a, a panel um, talking about mommy brain, um, which is really interesting. Go and listen to it. It's one of our talks for tomorrow. But in that talk, they talked about how um, like bringing parents on in a coaching model, but also questioning them before we give them this piece of paper that is like handed over as like, this is the home program, go do it. Questioning first what is feasible. So like, you know, Kaylee and I, we're here on as a team running the summit and there's many points where we just run forward with something, but there's many points where we have to ask each other, like, is this yes or is this no? Or like, um, what are your thoughts on how we could make this possible? And even though we have all of the skills as clinicians on what we know the protocol that to follow that will make it possible, when we bring in the the families as that interdisciplinary team, we we really we just take the ability for them to actually do the thing that it gets done so much higher. Um, and again, like it really um, not necessarily restores, but it, it it holds a safe space for the relationship of the clinician with the parent um, that we're working with. Yeah. And I, when I worked in early intervention in the home, we operated around this coaching model that really brought parents in. And it's interesting because it's such a shift from how things formerly were done that there is a little bit of discomfort on both sides at first, like trying to figure out, oh, wait, but you're the expert, but you're asking me to figure out a way to do this. But man, when when it clicked and it meshed, it was amazing to see the confidence in the parent or the caregiver in having come up with an idea on their own. So for example, if I'm giving an intervention like oh, we need to be working on trying to take some independent steps outside of their reverse walker. And so I may have some idea in my mind that I think is great and I've seen work great with patients before. Um, and and I could even just give that to the family. Okay, so every day from um, moving from playtime to snack time, you're going to have them you know, lock their wheels on their walker and they're going to walk to their high chair. And I'm thinking in my mind, oh, this is so motivating. This kid, you know, most kids love food. It's going to be great. Well, then that parent goes home and they try it and maybe it's chaos. Maybe around snack time, they've got an older sibling that's running around and begging for food, or maybe that child isn't really food made it motivated, but I didn't ask the right questions. I didn't empower the parent to take an active role in the intervention. So then it just doesn't get done versus I could have said, hey, we need to have a time each day where maybe like five to 10 feet, we're working on some independent walking in a space that your child feels comfortable. Where do you think that that might be? And automatically that parent has so much more buy-in because even though we're kind of putting some mental load on them of of figuring it out, um, it does help them to become confident in knowing this is a routine that would work, that one that you were gonna give me, wouldn't at all and we just see you next week and we would not have done it at all and so really looking at those family dynamics and not expecting ourselves to know them all but to be willing to ask the questions to get to the bottom of things and um be a collaborative team Mm -hmm, absolutely and even just those like those small opportunities that we give for families to and be part of the team, it contributes towards breaking down that like white coat effect, you know, where Mm -hmm. people are intimidated to, to advocate or to properly establish understanding with their healthcare providers. And so every time that we allow this to happen, like we create space for it, it also just like builds that confidence, which is something that these families will hold and use as a tool for their child's whole life. Um, And it's, it's incredibly important skill. 
Uh, so we hope that listening to this and, and also for us hearing your thoughts as you're commenting in the comment box um, has really brought up a lot of questions and thinking around how you manage this with your own practice or as a parent, how you are approaching this, whether your child is seeing a therapist or whether you're going to baby well visits. Um, we would love to hear your thoughts and things that are like your biggest takeaways from today, come and let us know in the, the comment box. I will be there with you typing away. Tomorrow we have a live that is going to be on Zoom. We're inviting you to come and join us and we're going to be dialoguing a bit more about all of the things that we've been learning throughout the summit. And I think, Kaylee, that's the point where we start saying thank yous. Yeah. So thank you if you've joined us. Man, day three out of day four, we're so excited that you are still here and still learning with us. Um, huge thank you to Inspire Spark for sponsoring today's live and also sponsoring today's giveaway of their little balance box and their sun hat that one lucky winner will be getting. Just a reminder, comment below, bonus points if you give us a key takeaway. And you also need to be following Inspire Spark on Instagram as your final check mark for entering the grand prize giveaway for those gifts. So you have 24 hours to listen to today's amazing speakers from 8 a.m. Central today to 8 a.m. Central on day four, but we cannot recommend enough that you upgrade to that VIP ticket to get lifetime access, to get access to the podcast so you can listen on the go and be multitasking as you're learning, be able to go back and um, refresh your memory when you need it, whether it be in a few months or in a couple years when you have another little one or you're just wanting to um, remind yourself of some of your key takeaways. And then that also unlocks that certificate of learning as well that um, can be used by so many different professions um, and people for continuing education units that we really feel like are so valuable and accessible in the way that we're presenting them. And so important, we really feel like we're doing um, such a service, hopefully, to um, this generation of children for parents and clinicians alike to have this valuable information from all of our speakers from the summit. So it's the most cost effective. It's going to be right now before the ticket price goes up at the end of the summit. So we hope we, we will see you on the VIP ticket as well. And remember that you do get extra information. Um, when you upgrade to that VIP ticket, uh, it unlocks that last portion of each speaker's talks that dives a little bit deeper into each of their subjects. Yay! Thanks everyone for being with us and don't forget to come and comment and we will see you tomorrow at our live Zoom call. Bye everyone! Bye!